Hi, welcome to the Women's Health Podcast. I'm Anthony Lowe, the Physio Detective. And I'm Marika Hart from Herosphere. Together we interview leading authorities, we answer questions and share our thoughts to provide the general public with the best quality information that we can find on all aspects of women's health. Please remember that the materials and the content on this podcast are intended as general information and they're for entertainment purposes only. They're not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Now sit back, grab your favourite beverage, or do your thing, and enjoy the show. Everybody, welcome back to the Women's Health Podcast, and I nearly forgot the name of my own podcast. (laughs) I'm Anthony Lowe, the Physical Detective, and Marika is joining us in Perth, and today we've got Amy back from Brisbane, the Australasian Birth Trauma Association. And the reason why we've got Amy back on is because Birth Awareness, sorry, Birth Trauma Awareness Week is coming up soon and she's got some stuff to tell us about. Uh, so we'd love to share that with you. But first of all, how you going, Marika? How are things? Oh, things are pretty good in not so sunny Perth at the moment. Um, we can't help but talk about COVID like every time we get on the podcast now, but we've still got no community transmission, so life is relatively normal, but I, I feel like my bubble will burst at some point. Um, how are things for you in Sydney? Uh, we still got community transmissions and... Um, masked up at work and everything. Yeah, I'm masked. The patients are masked. I even get them to swipe their own health fund card and sign with their own pen. Um, yeah. So, you know, haven't gone to gowns and goggles yet, but uh, yeah, we're, 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 it feels like we could go either way, whereas yeah. Amy in Brisbane is different again, probably more like Perth, and then mm. poor Victorians. Warmer though today, apparently, because I'm in a t-shirt and you're in a jumper, but yeah, <laughs> we're doing pretty well. I am gutted that they've closed the borders between uh, Queensland and New South Wales, um, but mainly because I plan to go to Byron for my fourth year. Is that bad? <laughs> <laughs> I right guess you can go to Coolangatta. <laughs> well, at least I can go to the sunny coast. So the sunny coast good. too, of course. Beautiful. Mm. Well, it's so nice to have you back again, Amy. For those who, who missed her podcast um, a couple of months back, Amy goes into a lot more detail about what the Australasian Birth Trauma Association is all about, where it, where it came from. She talks about her birth experience and what led to, you know, creating the ABTA and some of the projects that they're, that they're really heavily involved in. But so today's just a really quick one because we really wanted to get, I guess, a really an update on what you're doing right now because there's something very special around the corner. So we're just going to hand the mic over to you, Amy, and tell us all about it. Well, thanks so much. Thanks for giving me an opportunity to just uh, share with you guys and um, your amazing network that um, Awareness Week this year is a little bit later because of COVID. Um, We like to run it uh, alongside Awareness Week in the UK as well. Um, The UK Birth Trauma Association has been running since 2004. Um, So they've postponed it. So this year it's the 6th to the 12th of September. And the theme this year is on journeys. Every year we have a theme. Last year we had um, about birth preparation. Um, And this year, journeys. We really wanted to, um, uh, well, we wanted to and we need to because in these COVID times, um, like so many health um, charities, there's a huge amount of competition for funding. We still have uh, no government funding and we rely um, almost entirely on donations. Um, we've seen a huge decrease in the number of donations that we've received, which is completely understandable. But off that basis, we felt like this was a really good time when people are sort of sticking closer to home. But, you know, um, I don't know if it was the same for you guys, but when we were in lockdown, what was awesome was when you were out and about going, I was going for my usual dog walk, but I saw a lot more people. So we thought, well, what can we do this year? that would align with the theme of this year, which is journeys. Um, And we've come up with a virtual event, which is called the virtual walk and talk. And um, and it's, so it's whether you're walking, strolling, running, or if you're isolated 5,000 steps in your home, um, we're asking people to do a five five kilometer walk or 5,000 steps. 
um, and, and, and raise much needed funds for our organization so that we can expand our in-person support services nationwide. Um, and so, yeah, so the theme of this year being journeys and a walk and talk, we really want to start the conversation um, and we want to sort of share, I guess you might say, the light and shade of birth trauma. So we want to hear from uh, stories of um, women or their partners or family members that, have ex that they might have experienced birth trauma recently and they're very much at the beginning of their journey. But we also want to reflect how far you can come and how much that trauma doesn't need to define you. And in so many cases, in so many um, women and families that we support, uh, often they come full circle within our support networks and they are now in a place where they're supporting others or they're usually using their journey to, to shine a light so that others don't have to remain in the dark. Perfect. So yeah. Say hi to my new kitten. Mm, hi, new kitten. Oh, just wiped the pee treatment in my face. <laughs> <laughs> so that's perfect. It's, um, you know, it's something that people can do then, the walk and talk, 5,000 mm -hmm. steps, um, mm -hmm. sharing their story. And, and I, I really like that, you know, it's, it's encouraging those who've had birth trauma uh, recently and beginning their journey, but also... Um, hearing from uh, others who uh, have been through the journey, it doesn't define you, um, mm. how far they've come and, and, you know, even that theme of journeys. So uh, yeah. it sounds like a great event. Um, yeah. What, what uh, can people do in terms of uh, participating, donating money? What's some mm -hmm. of uh, the details around it? Yeah, so um, it's really easy to register. We've got, um, we've had a whole separate fundraising platform built within our website. So you can find that if you go into, um, so you go onto our website, birthtrauma.org and then campaigns and then you've got Birth Trauma Awareness Week and um, you, you'll then be redirected to the fundraising page. And a way that you can help is you either become a, a fundraiser yourself, um, share your story or share why you're supporting our cause. I mean, there is just, you know, we, we say it until, you know, this, it's our hashtag is hashtag start the conversation because for too long we've suffered in silence and we've not spoken about this. So it's, it's really around the fact that we want you to start conversations. So you, you could either do the walk by yourself, but, but maybe share your story or share why you support um, the ABTA or um, uh, you can support somebody else that's doing the walk. Um, we've also got a t-shirt um, that you can purchase that just says hashtag start the conversation. Um, in previous years, um, we've also said your story matters because obviously that matters. We now want to get into, um, a, a, you know, we really want to inspire people that um, this is the start of your journey and that you can get to a, a much better place and it might not feel like it right now, but we can guide you and that is really the premise of our organization as a whole um and i and i said this obviously in greater detail when we last spoke but um uh we kind of view ourselves as the bridge between you know impacted families seeking support from their specialist health professional what, whatever that may look like so um we don't diagnose we don't treat um, but we effectively take their hand and walk with them as they as they get to a, hopefully a place of acceptance. So, Amy, is there also a place on the platform where people can type in their stories, or do they email their stories to you? What's and then how are those stories utilised? Yeah, so we are hoping to gather a collection of stories, hopefully prior to the week, um, but also obviously throughout the week. And people they can either um, ideally. We'd love people to purchase one of the t-shirts um, and then maybe take a photo of themselves wearing it and they can share their story or they can email us at support at birthtrauma.org.au um, and they can send a, a video of themselves or written word or they can do it anonymously. There's, there's lots of ways that we would encourage that storytelling. Um, you know, I could say again and again, like we are trying to drive change from a from a advocacy level, but the power is in our voices, and the and the more that we speak about it, and the more that we share our stories, the more, um, uh, you know, the key decision makers will have to listen. 
And that kind of links into another little thing that I was hoping to touch upon today, which I think very much ties in with the, with the theory of journey. So um, you'll know, you guys both know that we as an organization really advocate for a multidisciplinary and collaborative, collaborative um, approach to um, antenatal care and information. And we really want pelvic physios to be part of common language when we talk about the perinatal space. Um, you know, you, you guys would have seen it. At the moment, your pathway to care is very much potluck. It depends where you are geographically. It depends who you speak to. It depends on your health professional um, or care provider that's supporting you. You know, for every woman that suffers in silence, there's another woman who goes to seek help and is dismissed. Um, and we really want to change that. We want pelvic physios to be uh, accessible to everybody. And, just fell off the desk. Um, accessible and affordable. So we are really calling for our government to um, support access to pelvic physiotherapist services um, and, and subsidise that with Medicare as well. And so we've got to change the whole petition. I'll send you the link. <laughs> right. So um, one of the best things that people can do then to help uh, pelvic health physios be part of that um, you know, that perinatal care then mm -hmm. is to, to go to the petition and read about it. Um, I know I've shared it recently in the past, mm -hmm. but we're going to put it on the show notes and we would mm -hmm. love people to, um, to sign up and support mm -hmm. this initiative so that pelvic, pelvic health physios can be part of that journey in that perinatal care period. That's, that's what I understood yeah. it to be, right? Yeah, that's correct. And, and what is really interesting about, I don't know about with um, change.org petitions, whether you can, like, obviously, as the person that started it, I can see the comments, but I think they're um, open to the public. And what I find really interesting, we've had 25,000 signatures, um, but I've got a big goal of 100,000. Um, and what is interesting is actually seeing the numbers of people sharing why they're signing it. And I really think this is groundbreaking because the, we're, when we're talking about the care of pelvic physios, um, the petition largely talks about per, postnatal care, but we know obviously there is a huge place for pelvic physios in antenatal care as well and hoping and helping women prepare for uh, the birth they want, which, you know, for many is a normal physiological birth. Um, and, uh, but of course, postnatal care, fundamentally, we really want um, women to know that physio should be that first port of call um, if you're experiencing anything adverse after childbirth, um, from incontinence to, you know, prolapse, uh, to if you're diagnosed with a third or fourth degree tear, again, it depends on the hospital. So um, some women may get uh, rec referrals to a pelvic floor clinic within the hospital. If that hospital has it, if it doesn't, some women are lucky that they even get any kind of advice on how to manage these symptoms. And these symptoms are manageable, but, but uh, we need guidance and we need support in managing them as well. I think it would be fantastic for the GPs to be able to, um, obviously they can always refer to physio, but to be able to you know, have, make sure that there's some kind of Medicare um, cover for these clients. Because like we discussed briefly before we went on air, you know, we have for chronic, there's chronic healthcare plans where people can see a physio in Australia for five sessions and that's, that's subsidised, but we usually still charge our full amount because it's not, <laughs> it's not enough to cover, <laughs> to cover physiotherapy treatment mm -hmm. per se, but it's, you know, it, it really does help people. Um, mm -hmm. But you usually have to see, you know, a dietitian or a psychologist or somebody else. It has to be part of an allied health team. So mm -hmm. I think having a new structure, and I guess this is where you're going with this, right, Amy? So there'd be a different, um, you know, system in place, whether it is five sessions or whatever, but it would be under some kind of perinatal pelvic health care team where they don't have to go and see multiple people and they don't have to have had a condition for X number of months or X number of years because, we don't want to wait till people have a chronic condition until they're actually able to access help. Mm. I mean, also, it's just removing the barriers, right? Because I remember, um, so I actually started seeing a pelvic physio at, at maybe six weeks postpartum. And obviously, we were really lucky that I had private health funds um, and I had someone excellent close to me. 
Um, but uh, you've got to remove the barriers to seeking support. And I remember like we, we were sort of, uh, we realized that this pelvic physiotherapy wasn't going to be a temporary thing. It was going to be ongoing, likely for the rest of my life. And I went to a GP and I said, look, I, uh, can I get any kind of Medicare support for this? And she said, it's not a chronic condition. And that was it. End of conversation. And then I moved to a different state and my physio said, go and see a GP. I went to a GP, told no. Um, I started crying and then she actually listened to me and then real and then she obviously put two and two together and she was like okay well you need to go and see the nurse are you seeing a psychologist I'm like yes so um, you there's you know going to making another appointment to see a nurse making sure you're seeing a psychologist which is what I needed it could be something different for someone else but you've also you've got a young child as well and so then at what point do you go do you know what don't worry about it I just work like I just put up with it and we don't want women to do that you know and you shouldn't we, have to cry to be taken yeah. seriously like that's ridiculous yeah. yeah and 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 then and and that's it and so and also we think that if pelvic physiotherapists become part of that common language it's brilliant because having another voice in the antenatal information space I think is is really important I think pelvic physios have such a lot to offer um, in enabling important conversations to be had, you know, like uh, it, it was still, you know, as I said, I think last time we spoke, the fact that the pelvic floor is such a fundamental component of childbirth, and yet, you know, we're just told to do kegels if if you're lucky. At that. I mean, how does that set us up for success? So um, there's there's big changes that need to be had, and hopefully they will be. Um, they will be had and hopefully Australia can lead the way. It's so good to have these conversations though, Amy, because I think sometimes we live in a little bubble where, you know, we, <laughs> we are so immersed in public health. It's what, mm. you know, I see day in, day out. It's what I talk about. It's what I read about. <laughs> it's what I'm studying. And it's, you know, it's, it's, and you know, we have these conversations all the time is that we just assume that everybody knows this stuff. We assume that they're getting hold of this knowledge. And I just had a client this week who came in and she's, you know, she's 10 years postnatal and she said to me something like, you know, I, I've never even heard of prolapse. Yeah. How come, no one in, how come no one talks about this stuff? And it was just, again, another reminder that, you know, sometimes we are in these little bubbles where we think that everyone is talking about it because we are, yeah. but actually it's not always getting out to where, where the information needs to get to at ground level. I mean, how powerful would it be if every woman that has delivered a baby knows to see a pelvic physio if, if she is able to like that I honestly think that that would change um not just have obviously her physical health but we know that physical health and mental health go hand in hand um you know I think that the, the long-term positive impact on that would be massive yeah, yeah absolutely and and you know as a local physio well America and I both try to spread the message you know, amongst the doctors that we have contact with. And we would love everybody to be able to do that in an, in an effective and coordinated way. But how much better would it be led from the top um, mm. so that it is part of the pathway and it is part of the checklist that is recommended to all the doctors and all the, the midwives and all the, um, you know, the, the uh, continence nurses and, and all the um, uh, breastfeeding uh, support that's there so that it's like oh and one of the things on the checklist is have you accessed your pelvic health physio yet um, mm -hmm. so would really love that to be a part of it or at least screening uh, educating you know if someone can say here are all the things to look out yeah. for and here's where you yeah. get help because not everyone is going to need pelvic health physio yep. and a lot of the people that I'll see for a postnatal check I'm I'm screening them and just giving them some advice and sending them on the way. So we're not advocating that everybody needs to have lots of physio treatment. Like we're not pushing yeah. physio down in one's throats, but yeah. um, I think you're right, Anthony. It's just getting the information out there so that everyone knows how to screen for these issues and, and tells women, here's how you get help and let them know how they can access that. I mean, that's just the basic minimum that we need. <laughs> I, see, I think the basic minimum, and I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I just think, yeah, you're absolutely right. Not everyone needs to see a pelvic physio, but if everyone saw a pelvic physio, regardless of mode of delivery, um, you know, or at least every first time mother saw a pelvic physio at six weeks postpartum, instead of just the GP, but that 
uh, was a combination of care, then that's right. You, you can do one assessment. You can check the integrity of her pelvic floor muscle, make sure she's doing pelvic floor exercises correctly and give her a prescribed plan. She may never need to see you again, but suddenly she knows um, how to do pelvic floor exercises correctly. Probably you're teaching her how to go to the bathroom correctly because it turns out I didn't know how to do that correctly until I was 35 years of age. Do you know what I mean? Like it's just stuff that should be part of the conversation. And it's interesting what you say about how, um, you know, we need to know where to send people. Like I think in the antenatal period, if you are seeking the care of a private practitioner, regardless, like if it's a midwife or if it's an obstetrician, um, I'd like to see that though those um, care providers actually have their own networks of pelvic physios that they can refer to. So it sh there should be conversations, like actually not trying to say, I know everything, you only need me as your source of information, but you might benefit from this person and you might benefit from that one. Oh, you're, you know, having your first child at 40, it could be worth, you, you know, like let's treat the, in like let's not treat the individual, but support the individual, um, yeah. And then the power is back to um, birthing families. Um, so just to recap what, uh, what we've been talking about, Birth Trauma Awareness Week is coming up. We would love people to sign up to either do the walk and help fundraise or donate on the, on the association's page. Um, you know, even buying a T-shirt, uh, starting mm. the conversation, sharing stories, um, even reading, even if you don't want to share your story, like go to the, the change.org petition and uh, you can sign the petition or you can just read the, the stories that people are sharing, which is fantastic. Um, so, so being able to realize that this is a problem and it's something that we do need to talk about. It's why we invited you on, you know, this is all hastily arranged at short notice. <laughs> um, so, you know, really fantastic that uh, you're doing this and we're really happy to support you in this. Um, and uh, if people can go and sign up um, and even donate whatever you can, um, and even sharing a story is a donation to me because it might, it might lead to somebody going, oh my goodness, that's my story too, and starting that conversation and just knowing that you're not alone out there dealing with some of these it. things. Yeah. Uh, there's one last thing. I know that you've got a video in the works. How's that oh, coming along? I did, oh, right. I thought we were going to be out of time. Um, yes, 26th of August. Uh, we will launch the first of our Think Natal products. So Think Natal is, um, is the education component of the Australasian Birth Trauma Association. And we've created a video series and that's off the back actually of last awareness week. Um, we did a birth preparation survey. We got a huge number of responses and that's really informed us on the um, uh, current gaps that exist in maternity care. We all know that they exist. Um, but yeah, the, the women that we support and the families that we support are all too often left asking, well, why didn't anybody tell me? So um, we don't, it's not an education, it's more like an informa a source of information really designed for birthing families to watch and think, well, I want to find out more. And they'll go to their, hopefully go to their care provider and ask the questions that are relevant to them. So the first one that we did is um, on perineal tears. Um, you know, the, the sad reality is Australia has um, some of the highest rates in the world of third and fourth degree tears. Now we know there's some amazing um, amazing organisations really working at, um, uh, at how we better prevent that. Um, the Safety and Quality Commission, um, I had a great chat with them last week and, and they've been doing some um, brilliant work that is due, I, I think, out in September, October. Um, so this will hopefully support that. Um, we want our, our care providers to actually feel confident and comfortable referring their women to this as an information source. It's completely unbiased, it's um, trauma informed, and it's a two and a half video, a two and a half minute video. And I'm really proud to say that we've actually got the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists um, president, um, Vijay Roach, 
and then we've got the president of the Australian College of Midwifery also co they'll, they'll be co-introducing it so um, pretty proud to have the two peak bodies in this maternity space launch a video that we've done and hopefully it will be the first of many if we can get some funding. Oh that sounds fantastic well done I'm um, very much looking forward to, to seeing that and um, as soon as we get off the call I need to go buy myself a Start the conversation t-shirt. Oh, hey, I'll send a, I'll send a link to that too. <laughs> are they are they in, in these sort of like you know tapered women's style, Amy? Yeah, do you know what? Um actually we had a, a wonderful organization that was gonna produce them for us. Um, but sadly they're in Melbourne and under stage four lockdowns, so their printing company is closed. And so we've gone onto their special website and done it ourselves. Oh. And um, and uh, I just thought we'll have a black t-shirt with white writing because everybody predominantly in the support group asked for black. You can choose any colour. Just It just says hashtag start the conversation. You can get a t-shirt, a tank top, a jumper. There's a whole range. Go nuts. <laughs> Five, four. <laughs> Five, four. All right. All right, we will, we will finish it up now. Um, Amy, just want to say again, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all the wonderful the work that um, you're doing with the Australian Birth Trauma Association. Uh, Anthony and I are big supporters because we really, um, well, we love the fact that obviously, you know, it's a non-profit organisation. It's all about supporting the women. It's all about making better change for long-term, you know, quality of healthcare and, you know, women's physical and mental health. It's all, ultimately, it's all about supporting the woman. <laughs> The birthing yeah, woman and, and her family. Yeah, very, yeah. very much so. The family. And her family. So we, we, we really, really love the work that you're doing. We encourage everyone just to get out there, sign the petition, please, and share it as well because the more people that see it, um, we're going to get more people signing it. Um, if you can, send, send your story in uh, for our Journeys Week and uh, donate, buy a T-shirt, go for a 5K walk. Anything that you can to support this, um, Anthony and I certainly will be, and we'll be encouraging you all. Maybe we'll maybe we'll share our little five k walk, Anthony, with our That's audience. Well, I was thinking maybe we should sign up and um, try raise some money. We'll at the Women's Health Podcast, and we can just do a five k walk, and maybe we could do a podcast. Podcast on the while we walk. Oh, that'll be. Weird. <laughs> That'll be cool. We need t-shirts, okay? You've got to have t-shirts on. We will be the wearing the t-shirt. Right, we'll do that. I'll order my t-shirt today. All right. I, did, I don't think I said the walk is on the 12th of September, so just in case anyone was wondering, but you'll obviously be adding the links. But just thank you so much, guys. Like, like you said, it was organised last minute, and I, I'm just really thankful for the opportunity to, to share an update on the work that we're doing. Yeah, fantastic. All right. Thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. All right, cheers. Bye. Well, that's it for this episode. Be sure to hit like if you enjoyed the episode and leave any comments or questions below. We'd really like to hear from you. If you haven't already hit subscribe, please do so now so that you can be kept notified when we release our next episode. Otherwise, thank you for listening and we look forward to having you back with us for another episode of the Women's Health Podcast.